Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Cross Point Community Church family. Good morning to friends of Cross Point, whoever uh, is, um, and those of you that are listening uh, on our Facebook feed. Good morning to you, and to whoever's going to be watching this somewhere uh, in, or sometime in, the, in, in during the next uh, week or so. Uh, it's gonna be recorded, it's gonna stay there on Facebook. So uh, it's awesome to be able to come this morning to worship the Lord, to gather together as a church, uh, to hear what the Lord would have to say to us. Amen, so uh, it's good to, to see y'all. Good to have you here. And um, we got a little bit of uh, a little little kind of a, a twist to today's sermon. Uh, Steve is out of town right now, so uh, let's pray for him and uh, hit the business that he's uh, taking care of, and for traveling mercies for him. Amen. And uh, that means that this morning we're not going to have any uh, music, but that's okay because the music uh, and the praise that we have for the Lord is in our hearts. Amen. So um, this week, uh, spent a little extra time listening to some Christian music to make up for what we didn't get this morning. Amen. But we're going to get something else. And I think it's perfect. Um, before we do anything, uh, I'd like to uh, just mention we have been going through a series of sermons uh, for the last two to three months uh, on the parables of Jesus that I've titled the stories that Jesus told. And we have seen some pretty amazing things looking at the parables, some um, some of the secrets of the kingdom of God, amen? And I, it's been a blessing for me. This week, uh, I felt the Lord leading me in a different direction. So every time I tried to go the way I wanted to go with the sermon that I thought I was gonna preach, the Lord pushed me back uh, another way and what we're going to have today then is a sermon that uh, has been uh, one that the, the Lord's been teaching me over the last month and a half. Uh, basically, this sermon is part of my own personal devotions and um, uh, my own personal circumstances. But then I feel like uh, the Lord pushed me this way because he wants us as a church to also learn from what he's been saying to me and teaching me. Does that sound all right for you guys if we take take a week off uh, um, from the parables? And we're going to look at a story, uh, some biblical history uh, related to uh, King David and to uh, Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to look at this story, this incident that occurred in the Old Testament. And I love it. I love it. I have so much to share with you. So let's do this. Let's read the text. Uh, I'm going to put it up right now. It's from verse, it's the whole chapter, 1 through 24. And we're going to pull out some really important principles from this. Uh, the scene, uh, before I read it, just to give you a little bit of background, the scene is the cave of Adullam, where the anointed future king David sought refuge from King Saul. You see, Saul was uh, pursuing David and seeking to kill him. So David is being chased by Saul's men. Um, there's 3,000 of them, and he's hiding in this cave. And then something odd happens, something unexpected and strange, and at the same time humorous, uh, something that ex would uh, allow David to uh, express uh, his faith in God and something that would expose his character, who he was. So let's look at it. 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 22. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of in, uh, in, in Jedi. 
Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats' rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. That's right. Saul went into the cave to use the restroom. It's already getting good. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost part of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealth, stealthily, that is secretly, cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Uh, he had a conscience and he felt guilty for what he did. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing uh, to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointing, anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave and some told me to kill you but I spared you I said I will not put out my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed see my father see the corner of your robe in my hand for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands I have not sinned against you though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand, my hand, shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between you and me and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for I have repaid, uh, rather, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good, for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I am, sorry, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore to Saul, then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Let's uh, bow our heads. Let's pray for the sermon this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for um, this opportunity uh, for us to learn and to grow in our uh, understanding of 
who you are and by understanding that we know who we are and we have come to one conclusion you are uh, you're great you're merciful you're loving uh, you are uh, the king of king and lord of lords and so we ask lord this morning that you be the one speaking to us that uh, we have with the help of the holy spirit understanding and that you might touch our hearts and that you might open our eyes and that we might see things lord uh with the uh with faith with confidence without a shadow of a doubt lord uh, help us to come to that place where we can be like david surrendering to you all the issues of our lives handing over to you lord all the matters that uh, to us all that is important and we will thank you in jesus name amen i don't know if you noticed how many times the idea of David's hand or Saul's hand or the kingdom being in the hand of either Saul or David. This is interesting. I want you to consider for a moment how David, if we kind of look at this story with broad strokes, kind of like maybe even summarize it, if it could be done, this chapter with 22 verses, if I could somehow give you a summary uh, in a sentence or two, uh, I, I think we should consider, once looking at the story, how David refuses to succumb to the temptation to grab or take something which is only God's to give. I don't know if you see that. He refuses to force, to take by force, to be tempted to grab a hold of or take something which is only God's to give. In other words, God had already given him the kingdom. Samuel had already anointed him when he called for all the sons and all of David's brothers to do a lineup and the Lord kept asking, do you have another son? So this is the, the principle today that I want us to deal with. David recognizes that there are things that are only at God's disposition. There are things that we will face in life. There are promises that God has given us in His Word. There are places where He's taken us, but there are only at his disposition. They're only his to give us. Amen? We'll see more of this and how this works in a second. So rather than kill Saul, when Saul was within reach, when Saul was caught unaware, when Saul was vulnerable, David cut off only a piece of King Saul's robe as evidence that his intentions were not to harm him. I think this gesture honored the Lord and it seems to have softened Saul's heart because when he learned about this, he wept and said, David, you're more righteous than I am. So when life's path, here's the lesson, when life's path doesn't seem to make sense to us, we, like David, can trust God to order all our ways to lead us and guide us down the right path. Let me say that again. When life's path and life's journey does not seem to make sense to us, when we just don't get it, or when maybe we have an opportunity to tweak it or to make it work out our way by forcing the issue, um, we should, like David did, trust God with all our hearts, lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him, and He would direct our paths. That's how us. 
Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. So this is, here's the action. Uh, we see that Saul, from the story, uh, he had taken 3,000 chosen men out of Israel. Why did he need 3,000 men? Well, first of all, they were going up against the Philistines. But also, Saul was pursuing David. As I mentioned earlier, and as we read, he wanted to kill him. And then we read that David put together a ragtag team of, of men uh, that only numbered 600. So you can see that there's a disparity between the force that he was able to assemble, 600, uh, and that force that Saul was able to put together of 3,000. We can see there's a, there's a big difference between the two. Right? David uh, uh, wasn't an armed, trained uh, army. His was a variety of losers and discontent vagrants and misfits that decided to follow him because they thought that he, and I believe that the Lord had shown these men that followed David in their hearts that he was the anointed one, the one that God had chosen. So we, if we look at the numbers, 3,000 verses 600 alone, it appears very clear that Saul and his men have the upper hand. I want to focus on the idea of having something in your hand, or at least potentially having something in your hand. Something you can grab a hold of, something you can take. Something in which you can be tempted to say, it's mine, now. I'm going to do this my way. This is going to be important later. And what we're going to see though is that the number alone uh, is different from that of what God wants to do and how God is going to accomplish what he has planned for David's life. Don't let numbers fool you. Don't let the majority fool you. Because if it's just Christ alone, And us, that's an advantage over the whole world. If all you have is Christ, you've got the majority. Do you hear me? If the only one in your corner is Christ, that's sufficient for victory. Because we are more than conquerors in Christ who strengthens us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? So this is the situation. So there always appears in life uh, something very different from what we really see and understand when we belong to God's kingdom and when we are led by God's providence, when we serve the sovereign one, the one who is in control of everything, what you see isn't really what is. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. So you guys are understanding the situation as I'm trying to set it up for you. So, so Saul... Saul if we go to the first couple of verses here, Saul, uh, in, in verse uh, 1, 2, and 3, uh, we see that <laughs> he, has, he has to go to the bathroom. And this is where I think it's funny. Uh, he chooses to use one of the caves that there's many of them in that area. This was the cave of Adullam. It, it, just, it just shows us uh, some of the most common and routine things of our life God could use and how much more routine can we get into than having to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's almost, it, it's odd to me. It's so, it's, it's, and it's funny. And, and so... Uh, this is a detail that doesn't often come up in Scripture. I don't know if I can find anywhere else in the Scripture where someone had to go to the bathroom and it's mentioned in the Scripture. 
right? And so, uh, but there's a purpose for why the Lord says it, because one of the things that occurs when you're taking care of your business is probably one of the most, the moments when you're most vulnerable. You're distracted. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Um, and I think it's a reminder to us also, and I think a key part of this is because we look at King Saul here, is that even kings have to go to the bathroom. They put their pants on the same way we do, right? Little did Saul know that the cave that he had chosen this private matter of going to the bathroom, how is it that he's all alone and all of David and all his men are hunkered up in the corner in the dark part of the cave and here comes Saul? Wow. It's like, too good to be true, wouldn't you say? It's got to be a coincidence. <laughs> I mean, the odds of that. Well, when God's on your side, there are no odds against you. I don't know if you guys are listening to me. And so what you see here in the text is that David, or rather David and his men are in the cave. And then here comes Saul. Now it's, it, it, it seems like a, a, an amazing uh, picture to me. He goes in there to use the restroom and Saul is completely oblivious to the fact that David and his men are in there. And I can imagine that they were like heard someone coming and they probably scurried into a corner, right? And, and I can see someone saying, hey, it looks like to me that someone has just come into the cave. I and mean, if I was there, that's what I would say. And, and they're looking out from the back toward the, what would be the entrance where the light's coming. So they probably see a silhouette, a shadow of a man, and they could probably see his size and whatever. And, and, and I'm probably sure that, that uh, um, Someone said, hey, well, can you see him? Or, um, well, actually, he's got his back to me at the moment. Well, obviously, uh, he's got his back to him. And, and, oh, wait a minute. It looks like, what? Saul. Hey, it's Saul. This is perfect. This is, this is ideal. This couldn't be... This can't be true. And then David's men uh, cry out and say, this is a day that the Lord has prepared. Here's our chance. And then look at David and they say, eliminate him now. He's ours. He's in our hands. In verse 4, that's what he says. Behold, I'll give your enemy to your hand. God had, and David had asked earlier in Samuel's book, in the earlier chapters, chapter 23, 4, as a matter of fact, if you want to look at it later, he had asked the Lord when he would be able to be free from the pursuits of Saul, his enemy. And so they're thinking, this is it, because behold, I'll give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Notice that? That's what Saul's men or David's men seem to be able to interpret at this point. That the circumstances are clearly an indication that this is God's plan. And this is what David should do. They're giving him advice. You know, it's like one of those things where, you know, people, when they kind of meddle in your business, they're the first to say, if I were you, I would do this, that, and the other thing. Well, here's the lesson about that. And if you can learn this as a young person right now, you will save yourself a lot of grief. No one can tell you what to do. No one can tell you how to live your life. It's not theirs to decide. They have their own life. But I'm sure Saul, Samuel, or rather, David's men, Samuel is the prophet who anointed David. I'm sure they were saying to him, look, it's your chance. 
And we need to realize that there will be people that will say to us, if I were you, but you know what the key and the important thing is to realize that you're not me. You're not me and I'm not you. And it's not your responsibility. It's David who's going to have to give an account to the Lord for his decisions. It's David that will have to live with the consequences of his decision. It's David, the one that God has chosen. And Samuel anointed to be king. And he has chosen to wait on the Lord and to trust the Lord for his timing and to do it his way. Now that is huge. Because the temptation would be, since he's now vulnerable in the cave, taking care of his business, to take him out now. Because David had him in his hands. I will give your enemy into your hand. And what happens? Well, these guys, the men of David, they've got advice. You know, we need to be careful. Listen, listen. I've had to live through this many times in my life. We need to be careful about taking advice from people. Just because there's a lot of them saying the same thing to do doesn't mean they're right. If I could give you something as a pastor today, when you face issues and matters in your life, go to the Lord first. There's nothing wrong with going to your parents. There's nothing wrong with going to a good friend that you can find in. But at the end of the day, having heard what they have to say to you, and yes, you would go to those people that you know love you. You will go to those people that you know have logical thinking and are reasonable and care about you. But at the end of the day, it's the Lord who you need to go to first. And this is what we see here. They're not always right. The majority is not always right. So this is what happens. And so what David does is he decides that he's going to do to Saul what seems good to him. So he arose and stealthily, stealthily means quietly and secretly as best as he could. He snuck up and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. You guys see that? <laughs> I'm sure that, um, and it doesn't tell us here if Saul was still wearing his robe or that he took it off. It doesn't say in the text. Did he remove his robe to take care of his business? We don't know. But whatever, David decides to cut out a corner of the robe. And he came quietly, like it says, stealthily. And Saul is completely unaware of how vulnerable he is at that moment because he's literally in David's hands. And because the sword was sharp enough to cut the corner off his robe, it could have easily been sharp enough to take his life. That's what I want us to see here. So at verse 7, and let's just read real quick through the rest of this. David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So David here decides that he's not going to take matters into his hands. So from verse 8 all the way to 15, let's read this real quick. We see the scene. Saul is now on his way out of the cave. He's going to go join his men again. And just as he goes down the hillside, I imagine, he's being called by David. So let's read it. Afterwards, David also rose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage, still giving respect to the king that 
was was God anointed, if you will. God had permitted Samuel to to make Saul king, even though God never really wanted Israel to have a king because he was their king. That's the story that you'll find back in the beginning of 1 Samuel. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? So Saul had been taking the advice of his of his men. He had been taking the counsel of his men, which was wrong. He says, Hey, behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave and some told me, uh, me to kill you I was actually advised to kill you but I spared you I said I will not put out my hand against the Lord for he is the Lord's anointed see my father see the corner of your robe in my hands for uh, by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hand. I have no intent, bad intentions for you. Can't you see that? I had the opportunity to take your life and I didn't. See, that's what he's explaining. This is, this is the point to where um, David ex uh, is explaining to Saul. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. So see, you're doing exactly what I didn't do. Why? I have no intentions that are to, to take your life. You see how David is playing back and forth and proving it to him with that corner of the robe. The next verse, and this is really important. You can see here that David had decided to commit this matter to the Lord. This is the key. Will we decide in the important issues of our life where we may have the temptation or the opportunity and potential to do something on our own, to fix things on our own, to take matters into our hands, to help God out. When that happened, would we instead say, may the Lord judge between me and you. In other words, I'm giving this to God and let Him decide. May the Lord avenge me. May he bring justice, is what he's saying. But my hand shall not be against you. David had made that decision. Verse 13, and then he goes on to say, as the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness. Basically saying, if I were wicked like you think I am, Saul, I would have taken your life. But the opposite is true. I'm not wicked, but merciful. Because I had the opportunity to. But my hand shall not be against you. Notice how many times he says it. But my hand shall not be against you. But my hand shall not be against you. And after whom has the king of Israel come out? So now he's starting to be logical with Saul. With his 3,000 men versus his 600. He goes, who, who's coming after who here? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? He understands that the numbers are against him. He understands that he's nothing. If it were up to just force alone, military might. He even says, I'm just a flea. Why are you there? It's like a... A gnat that's flying around, you know, and you're like, <clears throat> why are you letting me and nobody be such a burden to you? I'm no threat to you. And the proof is in my hand. I cut off a corner of your robe. I could have cut off your head. You guys see that? After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore again, he says, let God be the judge. Let God decide and give the sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. This is a pivotal moment. You see, because once Saul leaves that cave and sees after David called him out and showed him the corner of his robe. He shows Saul that not only does the Lord know when a sparrow falls to the ground, like Jesus would say, but he also knows when Saul goes to the bathroom. And frankly, you guys, he knows when you do too. What's this saying? Every detail of our lives he knows about. 
and he's in control. Even the daily routines. You think you're going to outsmart God? You think you're going to sit opposed to him like you're playing a chess game and you're going to corner him? And you're going to say to him, checkmate? No, you're not. It's quite the opposite. He's going to checkmate you if you fight him. But what if you go along with him? What if you desire his will and purpose for your life? It's going to go well with you. Verse 12, uh, again, you notice that he says, and what he's basically saying here in these last verses is, hey, let's leave it to the Lord. Let him decide this matter. Let God be the judge. Let God avenge me. Isn't that what he's saying? And if he chooses to do something that favors me, uh, fine. So, essentially, what David is saying is, hey, if I had been wicked, I would have acted wickedly. And I would have done what I could have done. That is, if I wasn't the anointed one of the Lord, right? I would have taken matters into my own hands. Don't you think? David's not saying, oh, whatever. Um, he's not saying, um, who knows what's going to happen. No, he's saying, leave it to God. He's making it personal. He's making it relational. He has decided he's going to leave the matter to God. He's saying, I trust God. And this is where I really want you to hear me out. Do you understand as Christians, as treason of children of God, that we have a relationship to where we have to make decisions in our life that aren't easy. To where sometimes that decision is to do nothing and be patient and let God work it out for us. Sometimes in life we have to surrender everything to Him and say, I know it's going to be all right. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I trust you. I love this. I'm not going to grab something and force it. Because that's a lot of times what we do. Like Sarah and Abraham, when they were promised a son... And for 25 years, nothing happened. And so in, the, in, the, in that journey, they decided to use Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. And she was going to be a surrogate mother, if you will. And she went into Abraham, and who's born? Ishmael, who would forever be a burden and a thorn in the side of Israel. Because they were trying to help God out. And they mess things up. Let's not try to help God out. Let's not try to fix things. Let's commit these things into God's hands. So David has chosen to wait on the promise. What is the promise? The throne that Saul still occupied at that moment. And he refuses to succumb to the temptation to grab and take hold of something which is only God's to give. It's an important principle for us that we're learning today. David recognizes that there are things that are only at God's disposition, as I said at the beginning. Rather than kill Saul when that was within his reach and Saul was unaware, David caught off only a piece of Saul's robe to produce evidence and this gesture I believe honored the Lord and it seems to have softened Saul's heart 
Like I said it, and I'll repeat it again. When things and when life's path doesn't seem to make sense to us, let's be like David and let's trust God that He's going to order the way for us. You see, David is exactly like another shepherd king. You know what his name is in the New Testament? Jesus. That he commits his cause when he was headed to the cross to the judge who judges rightfully. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and this is going to be for Homer. I'll probably bring it up again on Wednesday. Peter uses that same idea of committing things to God in the difficulties of life when we're persecuted and where we're treated wrong or we're reviled and he uses the example of Jesus who is our shepherd king and he says in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he was reviled he did not revile in return but he committed his cause to him who judges justly. If you commit your ways, if you commit your life, if you commit your issues, your matters of your life to the Lord, if you hand them over to his hands, he will do what's right every time. Amen? Let me finish by saying this. It's not easy. Not easy. How many issues can we settle just by doing what we want to do? I don't know if any of them would actually turn around right. We can, and excuse the pun, we can cut corners, see how the road fits. We can cut corners and do things our ways and refuse to do in God's ways, or we could refuse to try and take matters into our own hands, right? And, 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 and try to avenge ourselves and make things right ourselves and fix things ourselves. Or we could go the way of David, which is really the way of Jesus, and just leave it in his hands. Yeah, the path to the throne for David is long. I think the Lord was training him. Because he was very young when the Lord chose him. And he was anointed by Samuel. And it's a long and winding road. And sometimes we want to get to the destination, but you're not ready for the destination. So let the process be along the way that we trust Him patiently and we commit to Him and leave matters with God. Yeah. We can see that um, when it came to David's life, these incidents and these events are not accidental. And it is true what Romans 8.38 says, that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purposes. God is working your purpose out. God is weaving the tapestry of events in your life and He will complete, if you would, His work in his time and in his way. So it is God who raises us up and it is God who brings people down. Wait for God. Wait for his providence. Is that what you're doing these days? Is that what I'm doing? You see, this is just another one of those sermons that he preached to me first. It was just too good to hold on to it for me only. I want us as a church to know this. When things threaten us, or when things annoy us, or when people challenge us, or when circumstances uh, that we're facing are difficult, do we cut corners? Do we want to take things into our hands? Do we want to say, hey, I got this. I'm bigger than this. I'm better than this. Or do you simply want to acknowledge that really you're weak 
and that your strength is only found in God? Yeah, that's what we want to do. I think we want to do what Jesus says when he tells us that we are to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and trust that all these other things, all these other preoccupations, all these other passions and desires that we had, God's going to take care of it. All these things shall be added unto you. Leave God to direct your lives, you guys. I'm going to promise you, you will not be disappointed. Amen? God bless you. Let's pray and let's just uh, ask God to continue to work in our hearts and in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for this story about David. It's not a parable. This one now is a true story. And the issues that he had to deal with and the matter that he faced, he left it up to you. My prayer is that I, that we, that all of us, Cross Point Community Church, families, would leave matters to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to um, not have music because we don't have Steve today. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, we're going to take the offering right now. Amen. Um, God bless you guys. Uh, and then those of us that are watching online, thank you for watching. Thank you for uh, being here with us. Uh, and so we're going to uh, say, uh, uh, have a good day. See you next time. Don't forget Wednesday night, uh, Bible study at five in English. And so um, God richly bless you. <laughs>